changed. <laughs> okay, that's it. We are live. So we'll just sort of hang around for a little bit and wait and see if uh, anybody joins us, which, mm -hmm. you know, it's nine o'clock on a Thursday night. So we hope to have a few people pop along. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and see how it goes. So how's your day been, Sharon? What have you been up to today? Oh, it's been nice. It's uh, a work day. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was nice. I uh, actually managed to sneak in one of Sandy Hilton's courses today, which oh, is lovely. really nice. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, all in all, quite nice. Had my dinner. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, hoping to stay awake, shall I say, <laughs> at the moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah. trying to get through the brain brain fog so mm -hmm. if I kind of lose the ability to formulate sentences <laughs> forgive me no I can relate it has been a couple of weeks over here in the Rathbone quarters so uh yeah pretty exhausted <laughs> as well <laughs> rattling the patriarchy and your, your little ones have they gone to bed <laughs> yeah they're just yeah. on their way up to bed now so um so lovely. So lovely to see a few people jumping on board. We can't see you, so do let us know. Say hello. Let us know where you're listening from and who you are. Um, and we'll uh, get this show on the road. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm really delighted to be joined by Sharon here today. And I just thought it might be a nice opportunity if you'd like to introduce yourself. That would be really cool. cool. <laughs> <laughs> that gets me out of having to do it. <laughs> uh, what to say about me? Uh, I'm Sharon Goulbert, trustee of the Vulval Pain Society. Um, Vulval Pain Society, for those people that don't know, the VPS support um, women with vulval pain, their partners, uh, provide ed education, practical advice. We've got leaflets for people to take into surgeries with them and, um, and all sorts of things. And we're revamping and updating our website at the moment, but it's got plenty of resources already on there, workshops that we run, webinars mainly at the moment, obviously. Um, <laughs> there are quite a few on, the, on YouTube. Um, there's yeah. 10 of them up, uh, interviews with multidisciplinary experts. So that's the VPS and our conference we've had to delay until next year. My uh, background is as a former patient. Uh, I used to have vulvodynia at its worst for about 10 years before I started getting better. Mm -hmm. um, then I wanted to know why I was getting better, what it, why it was the thing that I tried and was it the thing that I tried was making me better? So I kind of delved into the neurobiology of pain, uh, trained in cognitive hypnotherapy, and now run a practice. Um, and uh, yeah, that's me, I guess. Um, I run one to one, uh, do one to ones and group programs, and also kind of encouraging clinicians to learn from each other. So multimodal practice really or interdisciplinary practice I think for best care so lovely yeah I really like I really like um the idea of, of clinicians branching out and becoming multimodal clinicians and really mm. starting to um open out that space and start to sort of break down some of those really strict mm. boundaries between us so just yeah. to say hello Rajam in San Diego it's lovely to see you with us and hi Tina um Tina is mm. in the UK and uh, and she's a hypnotherapist specializing in trauma work really really nice to have okay. you along and we've got Nicholas uh from San Diego uh hi and Amy Amy Clotty, I'm sorry, I might not be able to say that name properly. Um, and yeah, lovely to have everybody here. Thank you very much. Lovely to see everyone and uh, some friendly faces as well. So lovely for joining. Um, so we're here to talk about vulval pain and what is vulval pain. Thank you very much for your time and your oh, energy and your work in joining us. Um, I guess when we start thinking about this, one of the first questions is, what is a vulva? <laughs> and I know it's a funny question, um, but I think that this is a, a part of a, a person's anatomy that we sort of assume everybody knows what we're talking about. Hi, mm. Sandy, and oh, I'm Fayaz. Hi, nice to meet you. And, um, and we sort of assume that everybody knows what we're talking about. Mm. But actually, does everybody know what a vulva is and why we're calling it a vulva? I mean, I know that I had to go through a learning process um, because 
in my background it's always been called the vagina or actually mm. more like a lady garden or a lulu or a down oh. there <laughs> why <laughs> <laughs> mm. so what exactly are we talking about so this is really interesting to me because i would have just assumed as physios and clinicians you know the terminology is something everyone would use um and you're right when when i was growing up i, I hadn't heard of a vulva before but ultimately if we keep it really simple we're talking about the vulva is everything when we think about kind of the the female genitalia everything on the outside so if you think about the the lips um, and then the perineum the uh, the labia um all the way so if you think about everything on the outside um the clitoris everything you can see mm -hmm. and then you've got the vestibule which is the bit that links it's just the opening that mm -hmm. goes into the vagina now i mm -hmm. think this is where people people often just call the whole thing vagina and vagina is really the bit inside yeah right it's well, the birth canal um and jennifer gunter has this uh, brilliant um dr jennifer gunter has this brilliant venn diagram i love it uh where you've got vagina vulva Here's the outside vulva, mm -hmm. inside vagina, and the vestibule is that yeah. it, which is there. It's so clear. Um, oh right, so that's so actually the vagina is it's not even the bit the 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 little the little tunnel going in. Is that the vagina? Yeah, yeah right. Okay. Inside, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Oh my god, I've got one, and I, I haven't you even have got one. a clue. <laughs> No, but this, but that's and and that's it, isn't it? Is that there is so much like um like to me the word vulva is almost so sexual that we mm. shouldn't use it. Like the vagina is like it's like that's the bit we're allowed to talk about. But that's the bit we me, say. That's absolutely crazy because <laughs> simply, how is the vulva sexual when it's the mm. stuff outside? Is it because it contains a clitoris? Perhaps is that Probably. what it is? Yeah, I'm um, glad I'm drinking. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I think it's because it's got the pleasure, the pleasure organ in, uh, included with it, isn't it? And and female pleasure is is such a taboo topic, even in this day and age, isn't it? That yeah, actually well, it's know, more like, comfortable to talk about it as a as a functional bit. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, all you're seeing of the clitoris is the bit outside. It extends right the way inside. So we're only seeing a little bit on the outside. So yeah. we've just got, we've made it taboo. We've, you know, yeah. people put this meaning on the word vulva as if it's sexual. Um, no, it's, you know, it's, it's your external genitalia. Why does that have to be sexual? There's so much more function there. Does that it's make sense? True. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I think this is what's happened with um, sort of female identity or, or women's, like ability like it's all about ownership and I want to come on to this a little mm. bit later this idea mm. of like how do we how do we own and embrace an area that is so um that is so uh like s sort of steeped in this historical um lack of ownership like it's mm. almost like we're only just developing autonomy and, and people are still trying to take it off us aren't they you know mm. so it's it's a it's a really political and complex um, part of the, it has been politicized, should I say, it is in, in, in and of itself, it's a very yeah. um, wonderful and functioning part of the human body, much like mm. everywhere else, it's got its mm. job to do, but it's also got lots of extra goodies that mm. come with it. Um, but you know, it has been politicized and weaponized. And I think um, it's, it's a, whenever we're talking about this topic, we're always going to be pulling in on those those sort of relational frames, aren't they? Those networks mm. of meaning that we've built up over the time. But so, so when we're talking about the vulva, we're really talking not just about the entrance to the vagina. We are talking mm. about the whole shebang, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, when it comes to vulval pain conditions or, or pain experiences, what is it that you think um, we, as sort of general physiotherapists, need to know, or, or what do you think we should what should we be aware of just about the, the different types of pains that are that are mm. a potential there? Yeah, I mean, and there are a wide range because when we talk about vulval pain, all we're saying is this area is an area that has pain. It's a bit like saying mm -hmm. back pain. It's not giving you any more information than that. Mm -hmm. So there could be so many different things um, that could be potentially the, the issue or, or diseases. So um, if we 
talk about vulval pain as a whole, um, then as a population, these are conservative numbers, uh, one in seven um, or around 15% of women at some point in their life will experience some type of vulval pain. One in seven? Yeah. That's incredible. So that's a conservative estimate because when these studies were, were done, um, we probably didn't capture all the data. Um, so we're saying one in seven, at some point in, in, in their life, right? Um, now, for out of those, then something like one in seven of those, if they do nothing about it, the pain will just disappear anyway. All okay. right, it's a bit like most pain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do nothing. It probably get better. Yeah, yeah it'll get better. Um, but for those people that, where the pain doesn't get better, they might visit their GP. Now, here's the thing that's important. It might take quite a long time for someone to, because of the things we've talked about, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about the, the genital area um, yeah. and, you know, whatever, whatever people might kind of put upon that, whether they think it's, it's a sexual area, it's something we don't talk about, it mm -hmm. might take a lot of guts to, to pluck up the courage and go and see their GP. So by the time they get there, then really there's got to be some sort of examination to see what's going on. So the first thing is shine a light on the area, see if there's anything going on with the skin. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it could be something like contact dermatitis, in which mm -hmm. case, um, take out soaps, um, don't use soap, use emollient instead, uh, mm -hmm. no perfumed creams, none of that weird perfume stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're going to get onto the weird stuff. We're, we are self-cleaning, <laughs> we, we smell fine down there. Um, uh, Non-biological detergent can yeah. be a good idea. And again, everyone's different. So finding the right emollient for you is might be a bit of a process. Finding the right non-biological deter laundry detergent um, the worst view might be a bit of a process so that's if it's contact dermatitis um that could be useful for, for um other conditions too so mm. that's one thing but it could be a, a skin condition so if there is something to see then um the thing to do of course is to for the gp to refer um the patient mm -hmm. um to a specialist uh, vulval skin dermatologist ideally mm -hmm. um, so that might be something like lichen sclerosis lichen planus and you do mm -hmm. want to see a specialist um, to treat you as an individual and and, and advise um, advise you on that um, we've got a, a lovely um, q a we did with dr liz venner who's a, a vulval skin dermatologist yeah. um and that's up on youtube um so that's something if people wanted more information to have a look at but there are lots of um comorbidities when it comes to vulval pain as well so sometimes there could be another angle so mm -hmm. you know um with pain you know vulvodynia provoked or unprovoked so provoked is meant to mean if you touch the area or um you press upon the area then there's pain so that's that's right. meant to be provoked Virginia. Okay. Um, we're probably moving away from this kind of terminology of provoked and unprovoked, but it's still useful to kind of um, think about it sometimes. Um, unprovoked is, well, there's pain and seemingly there doesn't seem to be any reason for it. You, there's no pressure happening mm -hmm. necessarily. Um, then there's vaginismus, which may or may not be painful. Um, and that could be a tightening of the muscles or it could just be kind of um kind of what what my what's what are the words we're losing the the words you know what I mean it's tightening and, and yeah like up. a kind of, spasm. That kind of pulsating that's spas yeah. spasming yeah so look, there's, there's spasm, lots yeah. of kind of things that could be going on uh, mm -hmm. it's finding out what what is going on so the comorbidities um common ones are IBS mm -hmm. um constipation bowel issues so then could rather than a physio might it be a dietitian that mm. you see first of all could this be a dietary thing um could this be a gut bacteria thing uh, uh, oh i see what you mean 
So yeah. it's more like a secondary pain, and uh, maybe at the moment we're treating it more like a primary pain. Um, we don't, we, we don't, don't know. know. So it's, yeah. it's yeah. working out what else. So if there is a bowel issue there and there's constipation there, did that come first? Was the constipation there first? Yeah. Um, is this a is this a muscular thing? Is it mm. that those pelvic floor muscles are quite tight? Um, mm. So what is going on? Is it you know if they are tight or there's constipation, it might be um, bowel retraining. Um, or things like um, there's the Manchester Protocol, um, hypnosis protocol that Professor Peter Warwell came up with, I think about 20 years ago, which is quite useful for things like yeah. IBS. Okay. Um, and, you know, we don't tend to recommend things like Kegels anymore um, <laughs> and pelvic floor right. exercises. Okay. But this is important because when I, so, so as a physiotherapist, if somebody came into me and they were telling me that they had some kind of function and I had no training or support, say I had never heard of a pelvic physiotherapist before, although that's quite impossible, but let's just say this, this had happened and I didn't, there wasn't a pelvic uh, physiotherapist in my clinic, which is quite common in musculoskeletal mm. clinics because we, we tend to be sort of separated or it certainly was in my time. Mm. And somebody came into me and they said that they were having pain, pelvic pain. I wonder what what would be my first question like what would I need to do as a as a as a as a musculoskeletal physio that isn't perhaps necessarily knowing what to do next because my instinct might be or might have been before I uh, understood more about it might have been oh well maybe they need kegels or or some kind of muscular retraining and I think um, I'm just what is it that we what would be a good way for a physiotherapist that maybe doesn't know much about vulval pain to sort of compassionately start trying to understand this so that they even know more of the story so they can? I think that's it. that's exactly it. Know more of the story. Listen. Um, it's got to be the first thing to do is listen to that person in front of you because no two people um, will have the same experience. You know, it might on paper it might look the same but absolutely um don't have a plan for them before they come in mm. you know or if you do be ready to chuck that out because <laughs> you need to listen to the story yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely acknowledging that unique individual in front of you and what it is that's going on for them um and belief I think a, a lot of people will say they feel like they're not believed when they say they experience yeah. pain um, or they're dismissed so kind of holding that space and finding out what it means to them and listening to the words that they use you know are they talking about itchiness burning tightness the clues are kind of there yeah. um and I know I think Sandy has, has joined and I think Sandy, feel free to jump in at any point and uh, you know say what the the perfect test is for this. I don't know whether there is a perfect test for this. Um, you know, I don't think the Q-tip test is necessarily um, the ideal <laughs> one. Um, yeah, but it, it's finding out what it means for that person. And yeah. is it that um, you know the muscles are hypertonic or hypotonic? You know, are they? Yeah too tight or are they, you know what is going on really and if it yeah. is too tight then kegels aren't the way forward in the past certainly pelvic floor exercises that's kind of what we recommended it was for me as well what is recommended to me back in the day um mm. but that can cause even more of a problem you know it can cause more tightness so it yeah. could be bringing awareness to the area and mindfully relaxing the mm. area and for some people yeah. just bringing awareness to the area might yeah. relax it or then it's learning ways to relax the area whether that's diaphragmatic breathing and that could be the simplest thing mm. diaphragmatic breathing there's a lovely I can't remember which physio it was uh, put up a, an ultrasound of someone breathing just diaphragmatic mm. breathing and you see that in breath and the pelvic mm. floor just dropping and that out breath and it's rising it's a lovely movement that you can see and diaphragmatic breathing is something when you think about self-efficacy is something mm. that you know a woman can take away and just practice on their own to practice that kind of diaphragmatic breathing so it's kind of that relaxation response or Things like um, visualization techniques, yes. visualizing the area, relaxing, or making it more abstract than that. 
yeah. you know what would what would relaxing look like and imagining that imagining mm. maybe if relaxing had a color you know so no, that's interesting that's isn't it because what you're saying here is that even though we might not be able to um like fully go into what's uh, understanding from a diagnostics perspective actually we can probably we we already have those skills right we already can mm -hmm. teach that stuff um so we can be thinking oh if somebody comes in and they have pelvic pain rather than thinking oh i need to dismiss this person and send them somewhere else or i don't understand this is not like all it's the pelvis i don't do the pelvis <laughs> right actually we could we could be giving some real value at that point and starting to restore autonomy and that and, and, and empowerment and saying yes yeah. this is this is a thing we know about this it's, it might not be my specialist area but I know that um you know from what we've seen doing some uh, relaxed breathing might be helpful would you would you be up for trying mm. that would you be up for having a go and seeing how that goes whilst we put you on the list for the the appropriate clinician or something like that yeah getting them started and um you know giving them something like that if, and handing it over to them would you like to Mm -hmm. you know how about some diaphragmatic breathing should we try that together and notice what that feels like should we do some visualization together you know you've got these in your toolbox already um and you know this is not going to be um dissimilar to how you would treat pain elsewhere you know mm. we're just you know, we're talking about the vulva but you know if you're thinking about calming down the nervous system um then yeah, use exactly. those tools you know how would you calm down the nervous system ordinarily that's very um, true yeah um you know looking for anticipatory responses and expectation if i sit down then um it might hurt you know noticing mm. those things guarding behavior um a change in gait perhaps um mm. so all of that you've got within your skill set and can pick up on but the first thing i would say is is listen hear the story what's the narrative what yeah. are the underlying beliefs um what are the assumptions perhaps that they're making that might be erroneous yeah. that perhaps a little bit of education if they're ready for it might be useful and handing over to them what they'd like to learn to get started yeah absolutely and that's also really empowering for physiotherapists as well this idea that you know yes we might be dealing with an area that you're not necessarily well trained in or you don't feel immediately comfortable with but that's okay because you still have all this value uh, all these skills that you you can help with if you are able to sit with the discomfort that you have because you feel maybe a little bit embarrassed or you feel a bit out of your comfort zone and just continue to give the great care that you give all the time. Remembering that that validation and acknowledgement and belief and trust and faith in each other and the system is very, very useful. Yeah. So what, so if you could, if you could say, um, if, you, if, if the physiotherapists that are maybe not pelvic specialists, and I'm sure that there are there are a few pelvic specialists on here supporting you in, in this conversation, but what what would you? I, I love the idea of the pelvic mafia. <laughs> um, but what 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 do you think is the most important thing for physiotherapists from here to to just sort of be aware of, even just in themselves, like about themselves and how they move and how they are mm. with people, like what? What are the small compassionate things that we can learn that would have a profound impact on the experience of that person that's coming in with uh, the experience of vulvar pain? This is so important and I think it's an awareness of ourselves um, as clinicians how we are with someone else you know they're walking into this space this is something that they may not want to talk about mm -hmm. you know they may be embarrassed about and kind of holding that space for them but um kind of watching our body language mm -hmm. our facial expressions our voice tone all of that matters right i know it sounds <laughs> a lot we communicate so much through right. the words that we use the tone of voice we use maybe mm -hmm. the pace that we use you know if we're really really fast is that is that relaxing um yeah. do we slow down but almost kind of matching the person a little bit um kind of basic rapport i suppose mm -hmm. um someone i i was asking um 
women what their experiences were and someone came in and said look I got the feeling when I went in to see um, a clinician that they seemed to imply that I was making a bigger deal out of this than it needed to be yeah Uh, like I was wasting their time and I hear this a lot and it's really frustrating that you've summed up the energy the courage perhaps the yeah, time to go there to feel like you're being dismissed now I don't know what happened in that mm. clinical encounter um maybe they didn't perceive it quite correctly but I hear it quite a lot yeah um so ultimately even if the clinician didn't mean for that to be what you know the person mm. took away with them what do they do in order for that to be the thing that was perceived what are we communicating was it something in the facial expression was it a voice tone what was it so we just need to be mindful of that um but on the on the other side there's also over sympathizing and that's not useful either um and again i hear this is kind of oh that sounds awful okay look there's there's validation sure but you can validate just by listening and nodding your head not telling them how awful it is or you know that sound you know it's it's being compassionate right there's this balance between validating someone's experience um and then over sympathizing as if you've stepped into their space and you're experiencing it yourself no it's not about that right yeah that's important because it's not our pain. No. And we have to we have to be careful that we don't in some ways sort of like engulf this, bring it across into us as if to say, oh, yes, that must be, re- I can imagine that must be really yeah. awful for you. <laughs> we're putting our own meaning on it. Yeah, we're, like, it's not our right to put a meaning on someone else's pain. It's what it means to them. And that's Absolutely. important. What, what does this pain mean to yeah. the person? Yeah. Um, because it might mean different things to different people. It will inevitably mean different things to different people. Um, yeah. So, you know, is it a a loss of function? Is it something they want to get back to doing? And let's not assume that it's they want to get back to having sex or that it's sex is their priority. Mm. Um, Let's just take it, ask them, what's the priority for them? Yeah. What are their values so that we can then with them formulate these values based goals rather than us going, oh, what you want is no pain or what you want is what what is it that they want so that that's really important um so yeah exploring what it means to them not assuming not dismissing being non-judgmental and (laughs) perhaps sometimes silence yeah is is powerful just allowing that person to speak yeah, and I think what uh, Bronnie's just made a comment as well saying, but we're also allowed to be human if the person's story yeah. moves us. And I think that's very true. Yeah. And this is the thing with communication, isn't it? Like it is an art form, right? Learning how to communicate appropriately and how mm. to hold space that is mm. both validating and safe, but also um, wide enough and big enough for that person's entire experience to, mm. to sit in um, without without feeling like, we have to somehow jump in quickly and rescue it, even if the story does move us because it is profound. Like it, it's it's a profound experience, um, you know. But it's still it, it is that being able to connect with a human without uh, over without taking over, and yeah. um, and it is it is a difficult art form, especially when we're dealing with pain and vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because it's not about us. And I think it's all right to show you, you know, you're human, mm. but it's read it for the person that you're with in that moment. What's appropriate mm. for one person might not be appropriate for someone else. Um, for me, you know, in the early days, I had far too many therapists mm. doing stuff with their faces. And one therapist, you know, her eyes had filled up. Now, that oh. wasn't the right approach for me but for Mm. someone else they may have felt oh that that's what i need Mm. um it wasn't for me it made me feel far far worse and it made me think wow i am truly broken here because that's the meaning i gave it so i think we've got to be careful 
so while we're holding that space, we just need to make sure we're with this person and not make it our thing. Yeah, and I think that, so that speaks to me in, a, in an acceptance and commitment therapy way as so mm. much of this does, and, and I know that's my bias and I apologise for bringing it in, but but it's this idea of, of not getting hooked into somebody else's story. So acknowledging that this is moving and that this is difficult without necessarily getting so hooked into it that we're starting to to maybe uh, transfer across some of our feelings mm. and then it's that idea isn't it and, it and it is tricky and I think especially when it's something to do with the genitalia no matter what your uh, gender you identify with it will always be one of those moments where you think oh that that's difficult isn't it because it's so it feels so because we have this cultural meanings attached to this air er this area of our body that whilst it's anatomical and it's it's physiological and it's functional it's also cultural right it's also this this there is this like cultural meaning approach and I wonder if you if you would if you'd be interested if you would be up for talking about a little bit about the the vulva from cultural perspectives and how that in your experience has played a part in the management and treatment um and thriving with vulval pain I think that's an important question and one to explore um with each person um, because yes cultural or religious um, beliefs for the person may play a part in maintaining their symptoms and some of the messages they may be getting um, i've had um, you know women who and i'm not just talking about you know cultures far far away i'm talking you know this could be western society as well this idea that um for some people that look you know you're not allowed to have pain in that area you know you're you know you're meant to um you know if you're married to have have sex with your husband um sigh <laughs> um you know i've heard this thing time and time again of uh from from gps who just kind of say oh just relax and or just have a glass of wine and it'll be fine um really they're putting what the needs of of the guy or the other person in the relationship above mm. the person who's experiencing pain um experiencing vulval pain um and also clues in how this person was brought up you know, is there shame attached here, mm. you know, with that area that we don't talk about and we call something else or we just don't refer to? Um, down there. Down there. <laughs> lady it's, parts. <laughs> it's so strange, though, isn't it, when you think about it? Like, I remember the first time I read the vagina monologues and I remember mm. that those first few pages of just getting used to vagina, 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 and just mm -hmm. like, wow, yeah, we're really talking about this. And and, and noticing that it's very, you know, I, I would say I was brought up in a relatively liberal um, household. We talked about things like sex and masturbation and female pleasure. That was all part of my, like, that was allowed. I was brought up in a, a non-religious background, so I didn't have any of those influences, which is n not to say that it's it's negative or positive, just to say that I didn't have them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, relatively, like, I mean, it couldn't be more average. And um, But yet, still, I struggled to come to terms with the fact that I had this part of my body that I didn't know how much I was to be part, how much I was allowed to embrace mm. it or how much I was allowed to mm. connect with it. And and there's so much stuff happening there that you just don't really understand. Yeah. yeah. And I guess the difference between, you know, for if you think about upbringings and, and little boys playing with their, you know, their genitalia, their penis, mm. their, you know, their you know that they're, they're, they're exploring and you kind of just go oh you know it's just boys yeah you know but for us it's different sometimes yeah, um, no, yeah. Uh, that if you find a little girl who's exploring herself it's she's not being sexual 
she's right. just finding something perhaps pleasurable there this feels nice mm -hmm. but the frowning upon that may be far more and what are we setting this child up for as they grow up that mm. oh this is a part that you don't talk about or pleasure is wrong or mm. whatever else and um and of course and i think Kay from the verbal pain site said yeah it's true it's not always about sex um mm. i've got this story i have to tell you this story this is quite possibly the worst thing i've ever heard um oh. someone tell me i'm sorry yeah. no um, that's okay <laughs> i mean it's it's awful that it's happened to this person that's what yeah. that's what i'm that's what i'm connecting with yeah that, yeah um so she was from a culture where she hadn't had um sex before and she got married and um, she realized it hurt having sex hurt so mm. um, but it was her it's her duty to to have sex and have a family and, and all of that so she went from doctor to doctor very very dismissive comments and eventually went went to um, a private clinic and um, I know she had Botox but she may have had something else as well and all I remember her saying she woke up and she woke up with something inside her um mm. like a maybe a vaginal train or something like that where was the permission sought in that she wasn't expecting that that's that is very triggering to hear yeah um because that is well i mean i i, I don't really know what is the appropriate response to that but my personal response to that is wow that doesn't feel not only ethical but legal like I, that i mean to be to to have to be penetrated in a way that you didn't expect to be to me that's what we're talking about when we're talking about assault um, so i mean i wouldn't want to make assumptions on that person's experience but it's very triggering to hear something like that yeah and it, it was for me to to hear it as well and we were just having a, a chat and she just explaining what had happened um, and the doctor was very dismissive. Well, this is what we do. You know, you'll find that once we we take that out, you're you're absolutely fine. She wasn't fine. Um, and but when I next spoke to her, she said, "Oh, maybe I just misremembered." And something had happened between the mm. first time I'd spoken to her and the second time, where she'd clearly had a conversation with someone else that didn't want to take that as her experience and so she was now thinking she'd misremembered and you could see that she wasn't misremembering it no and we all and, and i and i don't want to play you know the the sort of we're women we know this card but um and, and i don't mean to um and of course you know not only women have vulvas and not only people who identify as women have vulvas and therefore not only women who not only people who identify as women have vulval pain so we need to remember that this is yeah. this is something that happens to a part of our anatomy not something that is gender based mm. um but it it is a, it is very shocking to hear something like that uh this idea of experience denial and then that almost like it almost has a kind of gaslighting sense mm. to it doesn't it really mm. um and knowing that this is such a big part of our experience our day-to-day -day experience of you know talking about something bad that's happened to us potentially in a patriarchal system right because the this isn't ne necessarily a man that has done this but in this case it sounds like it was mm. It's very hot. It's very triggering to hear something like that. Um, and and listen, when we talk about culture um, and whether it's a cultural thing or a religious thing, um, the doctors seem to have the support of the family. Um, and that's, you know, it was her, her mum, her husband all mm. supported the doctor and not her she was alone and you know what this is something that can feel so isolating mm. anyway mm. Um, because a lot of women who experience or a lot of people who experience verbal pain don't realize how common it is yeah they i was surprised. sitting there on their own yeah it, it's sort of something about being able to trust that part of your body and have a, a, a solid relationship with it. If we haven't set mm. that, if we've if we've if we've started a relationship with young, uh, you know, young girls as they're developing, that is is dismissive of their 
their permission, their own autonomy over their own part of their autonomy, we're already breaking down that trust. So it's so much easier, isn't it, when something like this happens for somebody to come in and give you a new narrative because you've already kind of had that your whole life. Mm, Such a good point. And I think, again, when we talk about terminology and, you know, knowing the difference between vagina and vulva Mm -hmm. is so simple, doesn't it? Yeah. why is it that we don't know the names of these yeah no it's like we yeah. wouldn't go to the doctor and say we've got um uh, i don't know throat pain or mm. neck pain but we actually mean we've got pain around our lips right exactly right. no it's a good example <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah just so you know why is it that way it yeah. is unacceptable yeah. so I think this starts right at the beginning with using the correct terminology and not these silly cutesy names Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, you are brought up knowing what different parts of your anatomy are called, just as you would, you know, know your nose is your nose and your eyes are your eyes. So that, (laughs) you know, when you grow up, you don't have this kind of otherwise, why why are we hiding that part and calling it all sorts of other things? Mm. What is it about that part that we can't actually name it properly? Yeah, I mean, but that's part of it, isn't it? I mean, this is that is that is that 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 ridiculous idea of the the sort of the mystique of a woman, right? The sort of hidden taboo, the magical the magical stuff of what it is to be a woman that nobody really talks about, our juju or whatever it is. And it, it, it's all feeding into this wider narrative, isn't it? Mm. This this mystical area where, where we don't really talk about how babies come out and men aren't really allowed to see it. Well, of course they are now, but you know, in the past. And um, they just magically appear. And it's, like, it's, it's this narrative that we're still struggling to just get rid of. You know, this idea that, men can talk about vulvas and vaginas and clitoris and we can all talk about it we can all be grown up about it because you know it's some it's a thing sorry but it's a thing has been for a long time (laughs) it's it's not new (laughs) and again getting away from over sexualizing things because isn't that what it comes down to isn't Mm -hmm. that why we shy away from it you know bringing children up but you know not identifying what these parts are called because as adults we're over sexualizing those parts these are children what on earth is going on here yeah that's a good point like why are we we're sexualizing it yeah we're sexualizing as adults not the children so we're putting our thing Mm -hmm. upon it and causing an issue possibly later Mm. on and you know also when someone does go to the GP and they, they have vulval pain and if they say my vagina hurts mm-hmm. let's say the doctor doesn't question that then we've this got is, okay. the wrong part of the body uh, we're talking okay. about. And yeah potentially actually, yeah potentially and yeah. you know they're actually talking about their labia or their mons pubis or somewhere else they didn't really mean vagina they just didn't have the right terminology for it so actually an appropriate response would be okay i hear that can we explore a little bit more whereabouts i exactly? am um, in your vagina and, and do you mean the vagina or do you mean do you mean the labia around it do you mean the clitoral or do you mean the clitoris are we talking about i think that's really empowering is it when a clinician says the words and what they're modeling is i can handle this we yeah. can talk about this i've got this like i'm i'm okay i'm mature enough to talk about this i'm a safe place for you i know what these words are I know your anatomy. I paid your anatomy um, enough attention, the anatomy of the whole human, enough attention when I was studying medicine to show that I respect all humans and I'm able to talk about this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, so important. Um, I had a, a lot of people contact me letting me know about their experience and what they'd like changed Um, And I think one Mm. of the big things um, with vulval pain is how long it takes to get a diagnosis. Um, You may be waiting a year or several years and, you know, you'd think that things are better. And yes, maybe they are in some places, but other places not so much. And that's really frustrating because, you know, if it's vaginismus, then, you know, 
again it's, it's knowing what to do mm. um because by saying vulval pain with that's the umbrella you know it's mm. like as i say like saying back pain we're not digging down into what is this what is going mm. on for you specifically so that we can then go into a treatment approach that's appropriate um so one of the common things that happens is um people get thrush through treatment and hey look it may have started mm. off with thrush right mm um or you know bacterial vaginosis and they get antibiotics and mm. and then they're on one course after another um and what was it one lady said uh gps dismiss dismiss me as simply having thrush sending me away time after time with increased strength medication um and she had the feeling that that was actually making things worse well look whether or not it was making things worse maybe it was mm -hmm. but in the meantime she wasn't getting the appropriate treatment um yeah and then incorrect um incorrect diagnoses mm -hmm. um so a lady who had a diag who was given a diagnosis of lichen sclerosis by a gp mm -hmm. um and was told it was incurable and then later on found out from a dermatologist that she didn't have lichen sclerosis um mm -hmm. and actually really that diagnosis needs to be given by a vulval dermatologist not the gp a specialist yeah. needs to be doing that yeah um uh, yeah so you know going i'm wondering back... about that sorry to interrupt i'm just wondering yeah. about that because i'm wondering if it if it happens where um you know a, a, a person with pelvic pain might come into a clinic and they might sort of they might sort of be saying I've got pelvic pain, but actually what they mean is vulval pain, but they don't know how to say it. And and maybe we need to be more clear about that when we're asking it. And the other thing I'm wondering about is um, things like vulval cancer, where actually we, there's been a big push in the in the UK, I think, recently to um, you know, increase awareness of the symptoms of this and that they it can be very well treated if we understand it and we uh, catch it earlier. So all these kind of things that we, we can be aware of, just like we are in every other part of the body, mm -hmm. uh, we can be aware of it and we can almost like switch algorithms. So someone comes in with pelvic pain, okay, we have a new idea, we, we've, we've, we've got an idea, we've done some reading, we've, we've, we've explored our boundaries and now we have a, a, a set of questions and a way of, of moving through this mm -hmm. so that I know not only where to send you next, how to write a good referral, but also what can we what can we do that I already have knowing that it might take six months to a year for you to mm. get through to the next steps potentially um and I think that's a really valuable mm. and valuable point isn't it and and and, mm. and I think if we can take that feedback of you know what we're seeing what what people with vulval pain are asking from us is to be more aware to be more forthcoming in asking questions and opening up the space so that they can talk mm. about it to have a, enough awareness to make good referrals and to have some kind of pragmatic skill in the there and now yeah. so that we take it we, we show that this is this is something we we're all able we're this is something that we know about we acknowledge we recognize mm. that this is here um and and it, it is that sort of validation isn't it it's it's mm. yeah mm. and figuring out whether there are times where because again you know we've go back to meaningful goals the yeah. values based goals what mm -hmm. is it this person wants and it could be look i just want to see my friends again and mm -hmm. go out and have you know coffee with them in the coffee shop or go yeah. out for a meal in a restaurant or go to the pub but i can't do it because i can't sit for a long time because it hurts mm. um so then you might be looking at things like graded motor imagery mm -hmm. and graded exposure pacing that kind of thing and there's so much that can be done um, mm with that that's within a physios or you know clinicians toolkit do you so think sense. yeah it does make sense and and I, and I think all I think this is it isn't it do does does all vulval pain or pelvic pain does it need to go straight away does that person need to go straight away to a, a pelvic pain pelvic specialist or is it something where we say okay whilst we're waiting can we maybe start taking steps towards this goal could we do a few sessions where you're with me and we can wait for that referral or well, it's good to get started with something isn't it but that something needs to be useful for the person mm. um and it mustn't be harming them in any way yeah um so again kind of exploring what it is that's going on 
with that person yeah. because if it is a skin condition and you're a physio then you probably you know I mean yes well, we you might do know. relaxation yeah. exercise you might do all of that stuff but yeah. ultimately they, they do need to see a valve dermatologist and I think um, that probably wouldn't happen well it might do and maybe it has and that's something we should know about um is that you know that that I I, I wonder how that would present in a in a clinic and whether how would we know if it was, a, you know, not all physiotherapists are really ethically allowed to do genitalia examinations um, because it is such an intimate thing, isn't it? So there is a, there is only, it's that, it's that fine line, isn't it? If you aren't a, a pelvic physiotherapist that's able to do uh, examinations of that particular area, then what can you do without doing all of that and um, without knowing? Asking the right questions. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds what like, like what do you want and, and can I do this for you yeah exactly and, and, and do you see anything unusual in that area does it look normal you know how does it look rather than putting yeah. words in their mouth um you know describing it because of course the other thing is because we don't talk about vulvas um, yeah. a lot of women don't know what someone else's vulva looks like and whether their own vulva is normal or not <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> So yeah. then, you know, they might be describing it thinking, you know, mine looks a bit odd. I'm not really sure if this is normal, but yeah. you might be able to pick up on that. Yeah, yeah, that's a um, good point. So they may be able to tell you without you having to have a look. Yeah, and I guess that's what we've been seeing, isn't it, with the, um, with, with unfortunately, what's been happening with COVID-19, people are moving online, all these, we, we are being in a situation and, and I, I say we but of course many of us have been working online for a while um, but it's a you know it's a new a new step for a lot of physiotherapists and it's it's moving them into a place where actually we realize maybe just how hard it is because of the way we've been trained to um only take a verbal uh examination and a kind of and, you know and, and it's 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 something where I think this is part of the physiotherapy training and maybe this is my opinion and you know I'm quite open that I struggle sometimes with making sense of how we get trained as physiotherapists. Um, I think there's large gaps in our knowledge um, in terms of setting up therapeutic environments and communication mm -hmm. um, but why is it hard for us to to take what the other person is saying as truth why do we feel like we always need to look and check and touch and feel and pull and prod and poke you know what is what is that about and is, maybe that's just something we've got to try and figure out as a as a profession mm. um yeah i don't think it, that's just physios mm. no <laughs> that's, going to be, that's, that's all clinicians isn't it that's yeah. all of us i think sometimes yeah. we just need to check in with ourselves hold on have i just made an assumption mm. um what are they telling me yeah. Am I hearing this right? Or have I just popped a meaning on this that isn't there at all? Yeah. Um, and then just maybe repeating and going, have I got that right? Or, mm. uh, you know, Absolutely. just checking in to see, see that that's accurate or not. Um, there was uh, someone on Twitter said uh, they got the advice from a GP that they had been using it too much. <laughs> I don't know what to do with my I'm terrible right I have no regulation whatsoever it's just like what <laughs> I mean as far as I know you literally can't use it too much <laughs> and listen you know she definitely wasn't using it too much she was right. in she was stinging um it was itchy she felt you know it was raw definitely not using it too much but it's that idea of punishment right oh, woman's yeah. woman's sin yeah for their wily it, ways we get back to cultural stuff you exactly. know exactly wrapped up in you know sin and original sin and, and all of that and yeah yeah so using it too much ridiculous i was personally told uh, by a doctor um to just get married and have kids and i'll be fine oh and I was oh just, do you realise that I can't even think about the possibility of sex? I can barely sit down on a chair 
walking's pretty difficult and you're telling me to just get married and have kids and why did you assume that that was within my value set that I wanted to exactly. get married and have kids there was so much being assumed yeah and put it in a lovely jovial happy way mm. um not good enough no, and I think this this sort of, I mean, what I, I'm hearing here all the time, and of course it's following on from my last discussion, is, you know, not only women have vulval pain, mm -hmm. and we need to get better at having mm -hmm. inclusive language and space mm -hmm. around vulval pain that includes mm -hmm. uh, people who identify as non-binary mm -hmm. um, or, 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 or gender variant, and, 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 and recognise that, you know, the person that we may find from the outside uh, judged to be a man um, may also be experiencing vulval pain and that's something that we need to get better at and I certainly need to improve in that and I know I make mistakes and 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 um, and and we need to be more vulnerable and open and humble with the fact that we do make mistakes and it is it is Laura, we've lost each other. Have you come back? <laughs> yes, sorry. Everybody disappeared for a moment and everything went black on my screen. But but yeah, you know, we, we do need to be aware that actually society has made um, our anatomy uh, binary, but it isn't binary. You know, mm. it, it does exist outside mm. of this like heteronormative idea of male and female, and yeah. and we need to be sensitive to that. You know, and 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 not do this, huh? You know, and and watch our facial expressions Absolutely. because they're deeply <laughs> offensive. And you know, we should be doing better than that now. Yeah. Like, we're in a, we've we've got to be doing better. Yeah, we've got to, I mean, I heard you say we should be doing better, but I think we need to be compassionate with ourselves too. Yeah, It's okay for us to make mistakes as long as we learn from it. That self-reflective mm -hmm. practice um, and just to realise, oh yeah, I, I can do that better next time. Otherwise yeah. we just stay stuck if we just keep thinking I should have done better. We're just yeah. beating ourselves up and, and it's not, you know, may not be particularly useful way yeah. of growth. Um, but yes, we can do better, I agree with yeah. that yeah 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 uh, i've really found this very helpful as always right i'm very very happy to have been able to have several chats with you and, and it, it does it is something that i think we need to just keep talking about these topics mm. that we feel like we're not allowed to talk about mm. and then um, maybe that is one of our acts of you know activism that we can do every day what one of those things that we can do to just keep moving the world forwards in a compassionate way you know what is a topic I feel I can't talk about okay I'm gonna go and try and find out about that yeah. um so thank you very much for your time okay. and you know this is something that both Sharon and I have have done we we do this in our spare we've done this in our spare time and Sharon you very very uh, generously offered your time but there is a cause in this, isn't there? So the Volvo Pain Society doesn't exist on thin air and there is a way for you to donate. So so to everybody that is watching, has watched, will watch, when you watch and you see this, you know, please do um, remember that the Volvo Pain Society needs support and help. Um, would you be uh, willing to just talk a little bit about what the Volvo Pain Society does and what it offers and what donations mean? Yeah, I mean, we're a charity. Uh, it was set up in 1996 by Dr. David Nunns, a consultant gynaecologist at Nottingham University Hospitals Trust, um, NHS Trust. And he's still one of the trustees. He's, he's immense. Um, and we, you know, we offer support um, in the way of information, education through the website, um, workshops that at the moment we're not running in person but certainly webinars um expert panels um, wow. and i think they're so useful i think um during this kind of odd time we ran 10 webinars with different clinicians so we have the full kind of multidisciplinary um kind of a good balance there and I think panels are a really good way because sometimes we just don't agree with stuff and that's yeah. okay yeah, um, yeah for people to hear that that you know there is an agreement on this stuff but um so we do all of that we've got um and you know we kind of do that in our in our spare time 
um mm. and then you know we have to we've got the software you know for, for zoom yeah. and then we kind of edit the webinars and then we've got the website we're revamping the website at the moment and yeah there's so much in the background that costs money that we yeah. have to raise funds for to make sure that we can deliver these things um the only thing we kind of um tend to take money for is our conference but even then you know we still have a bigger outlay than yeah. what comes in because you know we, we're putting on a physical conference yeah um, and I love our conference because um you know it's this opportunity to bring patients together with multidisciplinary clinicians all in yeah. one room mm -hmm. um, and patients partners too if they want to bring them along and you know there are these nice kind of brief presentations um, and then the opportunity for people's voices to be heard and to link yes. up. So, you know, there's so much good stuff. And we've got a, a leaflet called um, Smears Without Tears um, for people who go in and um, they're going to have a smear. I think we call them something else these days, don't we? Not smears. Oh, um, my God. I, I, <laughs> I can't keep up. <laughs> oh, it's such um, a bad, such a, a difficult experience for women. And there's so yeah. many things that blokes like you know your partner just doesn't know because they don't get this kind of access to education like you know and so you know we kind of though. have these resources there yeah. you know the leaflet is something that's in gp surgeries but it's also something someone can take in with them yeah so they can kind of show the person and say look i'm going to be doing it this way i've got valval pain mm -hmm. and so there's so much that we do and absolutely we do need funding. Um, right. uh, so the details of, of that can be found on our website, vulvalpainsociety.org. Um, as I say, we are revamping the site. Yes. So soon it'll be, you know, there'll be more resources. It will look even cleaner. The jazzled. Stuff. Yeah, it'll just be fantastic. <laughs> but in the there's also as so really up to date are the webinars we've just held in the last few months and um, there's 10 of those up on yeah. YouTube search for um, bubble pain society on YouTube and up will come up 10 webinars and we can choose um, it's a lovely education there's so many good ones there um, yeah lots of good ones there. and I will, I will link all of this so what i will do is when we when we close the chat down i will put all of these links in so if anybody's interested they can they can come back and and go on there but you know that's right so head over to rubblepainsociety.org please if you have found this chat in any uh, you know enlightening or interesting or you know you spent the hour with us you know head on over to the website and 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 give what you can because it will help great people like sharon to keep doing her great work and support supporting the people that need her um, and the society like wider to get the message out there as well and help us <laughs> share that message because without you know, and people like you this wouldn't happen so thank you yeah thank you so uh, I think we will wrap it up so just time to say thank you to everybody that joined us and uh, stayed with us really really uh, lovely to see people on board and watching and all of your comments and all of your chats and questions so thank you very much um, and and seeing all these lovely comments and all these lovely people that have joined hi yes <laughs> yeah I absolutely love this medium and um, it's it's the first couple of times that I've used it, but it's so lovely. You get that real immediate feel of talking to people that are interested in the topic. So it is really lovely. So um, I wish everybody a wonderful evening and rest of your week. And uh, yes, yeah, stay in touch and let us know what you have the chat and any questions you've got. I'm sure we can pop on later and onto the chat and see what we can see what we can link up with. Okay, so we'll say bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> bye.